grace and peace be to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Father, we give you thanks that you have helped us, Lord, to worship you in spirit and in truth. We thank you, Lord, that you also are with us during this time of meditation as we turn to your word and hear you speaking to us. We pray, Father, that uh, even as we come before your throne of grace, that your presence, Lord, will always accompany us. Teach us how to pray so that we can pray according to your will, according to your purpose. In Jesus' name, Amen. Okay. <clears throat> What would that question be? Think about it for a couple of moments. Now, this is a question that was asked by the Bana, uh, I, I think it's called the Bana Institute. They, um, they post Christian questions, they kind of do a poll. And uh, this is largely done in America, so most of the uh, poll results and everything will come out from their research in America. So when they ask people this, if you could ask God one question, what would you ask? Apparently the top response was, why is there pain and suffering in the world? Why is there pain and suffering in the world? And perhaps we can agree with that. It may not be our top question, but nevertheless we can also agree. For there is nothing more universal in the human experience, Christian or non-Christian, it does not matter. But there is nothing more universal in the human experience than suffering. In fact, many people point to the problem of pain as their reason for not believing God. Not everybody accepts God. Some of them reject it. Some of them uh, even tell us, don't ever speak about God if you want to come to my house. You know, uh, I'm sure you would have heard these kind of things. Problem of pain is actually a main reason. If you are not going through a hard time right now, then I can tell you, you just wait. You just wait because you will go through a hard time later. That is the nature of living in a fallen world. None of us can escape that. Pain is guaranteed for anyone who takes on the task of living, who breathe in day in, day out, sooner or later they will know what pain is. Some of us here today are perhaps in the furnace of suffering right now. Others would have just come out of a time of affliction. The rest of us will be there sooner or later because if you live long enough you will suffer. When I had my prostate operation, the cancer, uh, the, the surgeon, uh, he, he told me, 
you don't worry about this operation. Because prostate cancer is slow acting, and if uh, we all live to be a hundred, everybody will get it. All males will get it. Okay? He said that to me, in a, in a manner to encourage me, I suppose. But nevertheless, whether uh, we will understand that all of us will have our share of suffering. Now, related to this question as to why there's suffering in, is the question of how to process our pain. How to process our pain. We live today in a world that is sinning and uh, regrettably the, the, the longer we live, uh, the, the more sin there seems to be in the world today. Uh, sometimes I don't recognize some of these news and stuff that I'm uh, reading about or listening to because these were not at all issues when I was growing up. But now they are all becoming issues. We live in a sinning world, a sighing world, a sobbing world, a suffering world, a world that is filled with cancer, murder, relational problems, dementia, grief, genetic disorders. There are just a few other things. And then they are all present around us. When we become a Christian, all our problems are not resolved. When we become a Christian, all our problems are not resolved. Uh, resolved. Actually, we inherit a new set of problems. Because now we are going to be swimming against culture. Even in Malaysia, the moment somebody becomes a Christian, there is so much joy in the church. And once he goes out into the world, he will encounter some problems. Christian life is not about the subtraction of suffering, but rather the addition of grace to go through suffering. It is not taking out suffering, but imparting grace to us so that we can go through suffering. Romans chapter 8 is the passage we are going to be meditating today. And Romans chapter 8 is a very interesting chapter in the Bible. It is a wonderful chapter because there's so much teaching there and if you spend time meditating on it, you will have so many uh, uh, points that will come to you. But it also presents to us in detail three major doctrines of the Christian life. Three major doctrines of the Christian life. Some of these words, if you do not understand what I'm saying, please uh, research it. Don't, don't just listen and say, ah, I don't understand. But you research it and you will know what it means. The first doctrine that is dealt with in Romans chapter 8 is the topic of justification. Justification deals with the past. We were saved from the penalty of sin. And we find this in verses 1 to 4. The second doctrine that we encounter is the doctrine of sanctification. And sanctification deals with the present. We are saved from the power of sin. And we read about this in verses 5 to 17. Then we have glorification. Gl glorification deals with the future. We will be saved from the presence of sin. And we find this in verses 18 to 30. So how do we hold on to hope when we are hurting? That's exactly what is addressed in Romans chapter 8. Verses 18 to 25. Romans 8, 18 to 25. Shall we read this together? 
Romans 8, 18 to 25, depending on your translation, it may not be the same, but it's not better. Let's say it out loud as we read it together. You all have it? Okay, huh? let us start. Or let us all stand and read this uh, passage together. One, two, four. I consider the sufferings of this present time not worthy compared to the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subject to the given, not willing, because of him who subjected it, who hoped that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation is groaning together in the pains of childbirth and children. And not only with the creation, but we ourselves, we are the first fruits of the Spirit, grown in birth as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is sin is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Thank you very much. Please be seated. Straight away we notice that we need the power of the Holy Spirit to overcome sin. And we need the presence of the Holy Spirit to enable us to persevere in suffering. The main idea of this passage is this. To get through your groaning. Did you see that word while you were reading it? Well, the word groaning is there. To get through the groaning, we focus on the glory that is to come. The glory that is to come. And there are three ways to hold on to hope from this passage. Number one. We focus on future glory more than our present suffering. We focus on the future glory more than our present suffering. When we are hurting, we tend to get so wrapped up in what we are going through that we can lose perspective. I've had this happen in my own life and I'm sure most of us would have also have it happen one time or the other. Could be any kind of hurt, physical, emotional, whatever. And we get so wrapped up in it that we focus more on it, that we lose perspective. Romans 8, 18 gives us a correction to that perspective. Romans 8, 18 says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth compared, comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Whatever suffering that we have is not worth it if you compare it with the glory that is to come. The word for that we all began when we started reading this verse, it links us back to verse 17. At verse 17 we learn how our present grief prepares us uh, for promised glory. Okay, let us uh, turn to verse 17. Romans 8, verse 17. Now, if we are children, then we are as, as of God and co as with Christ. If indeed we share in His sufferings, in order that we may also share in His glory. Jesus has already set the example for us. He already suffered for us. And then he was raised again. Therefore, each one of us, it is not right that we should uh, uh, say that I do not want to suffer. I do not want to suffer. Suffering will come. Sometimes God will give us a healing. Sometimes that healing will go away after a period of time. 
but we focus on the glory that is to come. To consider means to reckon. For I consider, verse 18. To consider means to reckon, to think about, to calculate. And what is being said here, it is important to think biblically about suffering. So we are not surprised when it happens, when it comes to us. No, the word suffering is plural. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time, it is a plural word that is being used. Meaning we will have a multiplicity of problems, all of us. Some big, some, big, some small, but nevertheless, it's not just one suffering. We'll have many. But the word glory, on the other hand, means heavy or weighty. And the word glory here means, refers to all of God's presence and God's promises. Sometimes we use the phrase, He has gone home in glory, to refer to somebody who has passed away and going to heaven. You have sufferings and you have glory which is uh, in essence mean weighty. It's a weighty subject. Compared to the weightiness of glory, our sufferings are relatively short and light. Short and light. This is fleshed out in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 17. For this light momentary affliction is preparing us and eternal uh, external weight of glory beyond all comparison for this light momentary affliction what is it doing is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comprehension uh, comparison paul is not making light of his troubles but he is saying he is saying that they are short and they are small compared to the extent of eternity and the coming weight of glory. We should pay attention to his perspective because in the previous verses he described being afflicted, perplexed, persecuted and struck down. We tend to gaze upon our sufferings and only glance at our future glory. But what this passage is asking us to do is to glance upon our sufferings while gazing at the glory that is before us. To get through your groaning, focus on the glory to come. Number two, recognize that the curse on creation will be reversed. How many of us feel that our world is going out of control? It is out of uh, sync. How many of you feel, feel that is how our world is? Huh? Wow, very few people in this church believe that. Huh? Our world is not going the right way at all. Okay, I'm not talking about uh, human problems, I'm talking about climate issues, flooding and earthquakes and all those things that we keep hearing about. Uh, and it seems to be happening more and more and more. And uh, a few weeks ago we had a heat wave, but our heat wave is nothing compared to what is happening in other parts of the world. And with this uh, minute little fellow called a virus, that brought the whole world down to its knees for a couple of years. COVID-19. Okay? So our world is going out of control. Verse 19 says to us, For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. The word waiting here refers to looking for with expectation. And the phrase eager longing is used seven times in the New Testament. Eager longing. 
each time referring to the return of Christ. It means to stretch out your neck and thrust your head forward, eager longing. Okay, you stretch out your neck and you thrust your head forward. J.B. Phillips, who is a Bible translator, he captured this idea well in his paraphrase. He says, the whole world is on tiptoe to see the wonderful sight of the sons of God coming into their own. Notice that all of creation is longing for the revealing of the sons of God. Creation itself is training to see the coming restoration when Christians will be made complete at the revealing which refers to the return return of Christ. That is your destination. That is my destination. And we need to be able to hold fast to that. This is one of the three words that is uh, referring to the second coming. Revealing, appearing, coming. Martin Luther used to say, we ought to be living as if Jesus died yesterday, rose this morning, and is coming back this afternoon. While creation care is important, we should be good stewards of the earth God has given to us. This passage tells us three things. Creation has been cursed in the past. In verse 20, for creation was subject to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it. Why is the world going out of control today? Why are things not peaceful in many parts of the world today? When Adam sinned, all of creation was put under a curse. All of creation. In Genesis 3 verse 17 and 18, God says, And to Adam, because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. Genesis 5.29 also says to us, Out of the ground that the Lord has cursed. All creation suffers. The, backwash, uh, the, the backlash of Adam's sin. As a result, there is disappointment, there is decay, disorder, and even death. But that is not the end of the story. The curse that God has put upon the earth will be reversed in the future. When we go back again to verse 20, we read, In hope that the creation itself will be set free from the bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. When Christ returns, creation's corruption will be turned around and paradise will be restored. Genesis begins with this wonderful, wonderful story of a God who created man and created woman and he was walking with them, talking with them and they had this wonderful fellowship. All was well in that garden until Adam and Eve sinned and they were driven out of the presence of God. But all this will be restored God is doing everything in us for a purpose to bring us into this new restoration that is already prepared. <coughs> According to Isaiah 11.6, when the effects of sins are removed from our world, the animal world itself will no longer exist the way that we are used to see them. For Revelation, uh, in Isaiah 11, 6, what we read is this, The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the lion 
and the fatted calf to come together, and a little child shall lead them. Based on our knowledge of the animal world, when we read this passage, we'll be scratching our heads and wondering, is this possible? Is this possible? But God is saying it will happen. It will happen when, crea uh, when creation, the curse that was put on it is reversed. Then we find that even the animals are able to live in peace. And the little children will be able to play in their midst. We also have uh, creation groaning in the present. In verse 22, for we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. If you listen carefully, you will hear creation crying out for redemption. How else would you explain all the uh, earthquakes and floods and heat waves and viruses and all those kind of things? Is that not a groaning? Is not that creation crying out? The word groaning means to sigh with affliction. Sometimes as, uh, when, when we are growing up and we are given something that is too heavy to carry, we will groan because it is too heavy. As a guy, I won't pretend to understand the pains of childbirth. The women who have given birth to children will be able to tell us. But it's a good picture of what the world is going through right now. When my daughter was to be born, uh, like many fathers, I also bought books on uh, childbirth and all those and read through them and tried to understand what was happening and all, uh, you know, I do all those kind of things. And one thing that I read still stays with me until today. Uh, in a normal birth, in the normal birth, it is not the mother, it is the child who decides when he or she is to be born. It is not the mother, it is the, the uh, boy or the girl who decides when he or she is going to be born. It is the same with the creation. Creation is ready, creation is expecting, and we are waiting for the Lord to do His work. Hosea chapter 4 verse 3 says to us, Therefore the land mourns, and all who dwell in it languish. And also the beasts of the field and the birds of the heavens and even the fish of the sea are taken away. To get through your groaning, focus on the glory to come. Point number three. Wait with hope and patience while you groan inwardly. Not only is creation groaning, but Christians as well. Do any of you have a special sound you make to sigh, <coughs> to signify that you are groaning? Anybody? <coughs> oh, you are very quiet groaners. Huh? Do you make some kind of sound when the thing that you're doing becomes too, too much for you. For example, stress in work. Stress at work. Do you grow? Some of you. You're shaking your head, sir. And what sound do you make? What sound do you make? Sigh. What else? This side hardly responds. <laughs> huh? You see, <coughs> Whether we sigh or whether we exhale loudly, whether we scream or groan out loud, it does not matter. But we feel something within us and we need to get. <coughs> we need to let off a collective uh, sound. Brothers and sisters, take comfort. The reason I'm asking you this question do any of you make some kind of a sound of whether you groan silently or loudly, it does not matter. 
In Exodus chapter 2, verse 23 and 25. Exodus chapter 2, verses 23 and 25. During these many days, the king of Egypt died, and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God, and God heard their groaning. And God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. God hears your groan. According to Romans 8, 23, we know that the world is not all there is because we are not whole yet. Not only the creation, but we ourselves, we have the first fruits of the Spirit, groaning, groaning inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. This is a chapter that I really uh, feel that we need to spend time on. We need to spend time on to understand the full weight of what is being said, Romans chapter 8. There's so many things that are just, Paul is just writing them out and sometimes we run the risk of reading them, closing the Bible and going about our daily work. We need to spend time asking ourselves, what is this word, first fruits of the Spirit, what does that mean? Adoption as sons, what does that mean? Redemption of our bodies, what does that phrase mean? Believers have been given the first fruits of the Spirit, which means that we have been given the first installment and pledge of the final delivery. When we go to buy a car, unless you are very rich and you can pay cash for the car straight away, most of us would take the route of uh, putting a down payment, don't we? That down payment that we put for the car, while the loan is processed or whatever, the down payment that is called for when we are ready is the first fruit of the car. The first installment. It is a promise by the car dealership to deliver the car to you. When I bought my cars, the salesman never asked me for, to put down 10% 10, 10 until my loan was processed and it was approved. Then he would call me and tell me it's all ready, are you ready to pay? In a little way, this will help us to understand what it means by first fruits of the Spirit. It is the initial, uh, initial uh, what is that called? offering uh, that is made, the first installment that is made by God. It is made in faith. But that is not all. I don't pay the 10% and go home. I pay the 10% and two, three days later I drive home the car. A 10% is a promise that more will come. And I'll get my shiny new car a couple of days later. In a way, this is what this passage means. God has given us the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is working within us. But the Holy Spirit is also a reminder in and of Himself. A reminder that there will be a greater harvest to come. When we use the word fruit, it means harvest. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5, we read that God has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. <clears throat> the word adoption was used in two senses. The first described how an orphan was moved into a new family with all the rights and privileges of that family. The second referred to a Roman family publicly acknowledging the child as a full heir. This speaks of the time when we will stand with the Lord in heaven and he announces I want to introduce you to my child. He says that to the father. In that sense, the final stage of our adoption 
is still in the future. It is still in the future. In the meantime, we groan, we groan on the inside as we wait, wait with eagerness for our full adoption as the sons of God and the redemption of our bodies. <coughs> There's so much here, you know, I'm, I'm just rushing through it and I'm sure uh, most of you <coughs> will be wondering what is going on. I wish we could do justice to this little passage. Okay. The fourth point is this, for in this tent we groan longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. For while we are still in this tent, we groan big burden. There are so much terrible things going on which makes us groan. Which makes us groan. The groaning is a deep, intense, universal, inward response to sin and suffering. We can't even put it into words. The groaning that comes, and if I can use this word, I'll say the grossness of sin. The grossness of sin, not just sin itself but the ugliness of sin, the greatness of suffering. For the Christian, when he reads about this or when he sees this, he should have a longing for the glory to come. Because that's the only thing that can stop all this. He has to have a longing for glory. Sometimes, when we look at all that is going around, if we, if we are emotionally involved, we want to scream. We grieve, we groan. But all, the, all this is necessary in order for the glory to come. As we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, then all this suffering will stop. A pastor once said about suffering, yes, it's bad, but it's not going to last forever. Yes, it's terrible, but this is not the final story. This isn't the last chapter. Yes, we will suffer, but God has ordained that our suffering is temporary. Something better for us is on the way. The word hope is used five times in verses 24 and 25. Five times. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Five times the word hope is used. I just want to point out that the word hope in the Bible is very different from how it is used in our culture. Where most people would equate hope as I wish or I want. Kind of uh, throwing darts and it hopes, uh, and you hope it will hit the middle. That is how we sometimes hope. Sometimes a child will say, I hope there will be peace in this world. I hope China and the US will get along. I hope Russia and Ukraine will get along, and all these kind of things. That is not the hope that we see here. The hope that we see here, the biblical usage of this word is hope is an assurance based on a conviction. Hope is an assurance based on a conviction. A deeply settled knowledge grounded in the promises of God. God invites him to trust him as our hope. In Psalm 71 verse 5, when he says, For you, O Lord, are my hope. 1 Peter 1 3 says, We are born again to a living hope. Colossians 1 27 reminds us of the source of hope. Christ in you, the hope of glory. 
all these things that we read in the Bible should give us the conviction. And that conviction will give us the assurance. And it is on that assurance that I base my hope on. Not wishful thinking. Not hoping this fellow will meet that fellow and there will be peace. None of that. It is a biblical uh, meaning that we are looking at. We wait for it with patience. Patience is the ability to endure pain and problems because we are on the way to heaven. We are reminded there is an invisible world which is much more real than this visible world. The day we became a, cry, uh, a, a disciple of Jesus Christ, we have became members of the Kingdom of God. I cannot show you my passport, neither can any of you show me your passport, but we know that. We are members of the Kingdom of God. So today, in summary, we have looked at three things. Number one, focus on future glory more than your present suffering. Number two, recognize the curse on creation will be reversed. Number three, wait with hope and patience while you groan inwardly. God isn't somebody who's uh, far away looking at us, going through all our things, laughing and saying, what silly people, what are they doing and all that. God isn't that kind of a God. So when they come back again to the Bana Po, God's ultimate answer to suffering isn't an explanation. It is the incarnation of Jesus Christ. The best answer to the problem of evil is Jesus Christ. God isn't a detached, distant or disinterested deity like many of the religions today. He sent his, suffer, his son who entered our world of suffering, evil and pain. The son came in to this world when we were not expecting him. He took the worst of it for you and for me. He died as our substitute. He was raised to life as a victor, ascended to heaven as the conqueror, and is coming in glorious triumph. And we recite this in the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed. Somebody said this very well, and with that I will end this uh, sharing. The next time when you are tempted to ask God, why did you do this to me? Look at the cross and ask, why did you do that for me? The cross is a symbol of God's love. Shall we pray? Father, we want to thank you, praise you Lord for this time together. We pray that of all that we have heard, we may remember one or two things. Help us, Father, to dwell upon that, to meditate on this one or two things throughout this week, so that our lives as Christians, Father, will continue to grow, continue to be built up, so that we will be uh, able to be presented as uh, disciples of Jesus Christ, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Let's rise and sing our last song. He will carry you through. Yeah.
us all pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be our name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and let us ask the Lord, as we forgive the rest of us for our sins, and let us not into a kingdom, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace.